The Myth of the Genius of Gene Sharp. Da -da 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 -da. Look at this list of revolutionary suggestions from the white English-speaking American man who claimed credit for the success of the Arab Spring. <laughs> who claimed, claimed credit for the amazing success that we see in Syria today in the year 2020. For the unbelievable transformation of the non-violent transformation of Libya that you see ongoing today. Here you go. Here are his suggestions. Number 123 through 132. Right there in the middle. Withdrawal from government educational institutions. In plain English, drop out of school. <laughs> what, what a great suggestion. Tell me something. I'm not going to read out this whole list to you. There are fully 198 items in the list. I'll characterize them and describe them further. But just, just looking at this section of the list, do you think this would have prevented the ascent of fascism in Japan in the years leading up to World War II. If all the people of good conscience uh, dropped out of school, <laughs> I suggest to you, do you think that do you think that would have prevented tyranny in Japan? How about um, how about indigenous peoples in North America? You know, let, let's even take easy examples like the Navajo Indians who weren't completely driven off their land, weren't completely driven to extinction through, through violent means. People had a little bit of a chance to negotiate with government authorities, uh, far from the most extreme examples in terms of uh, the history of genocide around these parts. Do you think, um, do you think dropping out of school would have been uh, good advice to them? Do you think that would have helped their people survive the pressures of genocide and tyranny from the government of the United States of America or British Empire before that? No? Hmm? Can you think of any conflict in the world, past, present, or future, in which this is good advice, let alone genius? Can you think of any conflict, whether it be Syria or Libya, where um, you know this list of advice could, be, could merit calling this man the Machiavelli behind the Arab Spring, the brains behind the... Um, Occupy Wall Street movement, all the other laurels and praise heaped on Gene Sharp, and to some extent appropriated by, arrogated by Gene Sharp. In the video I made before this one, I was uh, alluding to Gene Sharp when I said there was a rotating cast of characters in the year 2011, 2012, 2013, who kept appearing on uh, BBC Hard Talk and so on. I checked my memory. Gene Sharp was indeed on the BBC talk show Hard Talk. <laughs> He was really precisely and especially the person I was alluding to in that, but wasn't the only one. Um, why was he so prominent? There's money involved. Guys like Gene Sharp survived on donations given to his foundation. So in the same way that you have a completely cynical, self-serving uh, charity in our times, like Extinction Rebellion, getting out in front of those headlines and saying, we're the ones responsible for this. Put money into our bank accounts now. Uh, Gene Sharp leapt at the chance to get donation dollars flowing into his bizarre, eccentric organization. Um, organization that he called uh, the Albert Einstein Foundation. <laughs> no connection to Albert Einstein. I think that he, um, he liked to think of himself as the Albert Einstein of nonviolent regime change activism. Okay, here are numbers 181. To 192, the, obviously this is towards the end of a list of 198 uh, methods. Hmm, politically motivated counterfeiting. <laughs> any any real world example right now in Syria? Would you go over there and get involved in counterfeiting, and then you know quite likely being hunted down and imprisoned or killed for for counterfeiting in Japan during the rise of fascism, the transition? Because they did, they had a parliament, they had a shaky democracy, and things got shakier and shakier. And before you know it, it was more or less the dictatorship. Um, Joseph Stalin. Uh, do you think? Do you really believe that counterfeiting is a is a defensible method of? Uh, I don't even know how to say this. It's not just civil disobedience. He's talking about regime change, a way to challenge a dictatorial or tyrannical regime and replace it with a democratic one. Saudi Arabia, you in the audience, I'm talking about you. Would you personally risk your life 
to engage in counterfeiting in Saudi Arabia. When you believe, you know what, it's worth it. It's worth it to face jail or the death penalty to be counterfeiting in the name of democracy, in the name of progress, in the name of some... No. Okay, let's look at the other, the other items on this list. Reverse strike. Stay in strike. Nonviolent land seizure. Mm -hmm, mm hmm Yeah, you know, I, I, not only would I say that's a bad suggestion for, say, First Nations people here in Canada, or Native people or Indigenous people, um, where they are, they're unlikely to be killed. I mean, the government of Canada is not going to shoot them dead if they involve... Heard of a little country named China? How do you think that shit would go down if you're opposing the Communist Party, the current, you know, non-democratic government? That and how do you think that would go down in, say, Saudi Arabia? What if the land you tried to seize had valuable oil assets on it? Or <laughs> just think this shit through. Oh, yeah, I'm going to sit here in my armchair and I'm going to publish a book and put it on the internet and I'm going to accept donations, you know, uh, recommending the people engage in uh, uh, counterfeiting and non-violent <laughs> land seizure. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, non-violent land seizure soon enough tends to get violent. And uh, again, even in the current Canadian context, where the government is relatively sympathetic towards those types of disruptions, you know, they don't just send in the tanks. Um, but, but again, Canada already is a democracy, so it's not really what he's talking about here. We'd have to be talking about Libya, Syria, China, Saudi Arabia, all right? Um, the rest of this list is not worth, it's not worth reading out. The only things on this list that aren't ridiculous, dangerous, and self-destructive are the things that aren't worth talking about because they are such well-worn, familiar canards from every form of mainstream political activism. Like, he recommends marching on the streets. He recommends slogans. He recommends spray-painting slogans. Um, having a color-coordinated leafleting campaign. Crap like this. I mean, crap like what? what you could have got this out of the Nabisco marketing campaign. It's just, you know, it's just nothing special. There's nothing interesting about it. And if you want to claim this is the key to success, like, you know, in a really high-risk situation like Saudi Arabia or something, history is actually quite lacking in positive examples of that. And, um, you know, normally if you go through the history episode by episode, even if you look at a, a case study where that was one part of the, the progress that was made. Like, oh yeah, there were some leaflets, there was some spray painting or so on. It, it's, it's normally, I can't even call it the icing on the cake. I mean, it's a minor footnote. It's a minor decorative element of major political changes that were, that were ongoing and that very often did indeed involve uh, military uh, intervention and what have you, okay? Now, there are two claims being made in this video. Let's spell them out. One, I'm claiming that Gene Sharp was a bullshit artist, that his actual books were bullshit, that his actual advice was bullshit in and of itself, and that he um, was what you would call an ambulance chaser, somewhat old-fashioned old slang now, that he saw this uh, crisis unfolding, the Arab Spring, and he tried to chase after the story, get himself into the headlines, get into the newspapers, because that would get more donations for his cause, for his foundation. That's not evil, but it's dumb, and it shouldn't be celebrated, and he shouldn't be given credit for this. So this is, this is one part of it. Now, what I'm warning against here has very clear uh, parallels for activism, you know, as diverse as the vegan movement, as feminism, as all kinds of things going on in the world. This, we, have to, we have to watch out for this sort of thing, okay? So that's one part of it. The other thing I'm calling into question, or really ridiculing, is the notion that this bullshit career of Gene Sharp had anything important to do with the progress or history of the Arab Spring itself. Okay? Now, again, in a world where a butterfly flapping its wings is connected to a tornado, I can't say there is absolutely zero significance to the peculiar career of Gene Sharp and his tiny foundation, but... Um, how significant was the influence of Gene Sharp compared to the significance of the collapse of the Iraqi regime headed by Saddam Hussein? If you go through the interviews of any of these guys who stood up and decided to risk their lives in Syria or Libya or even in Egypt, you'll find that one of the common themes is they were spending a lot of time watching satellite television, not the internet, Satellite television in the Arab world at that time was really the crucial medium. And they watched what they had thought of as an unassailable strongman regime 
getting torn down and destroyed, including, by the way, the really X-rated pictures of Saddam himself being humiliated and tortured and killed. I mean, the, the actual footage from the very end of Saddam's life when he's kind of dragged through the streets. And that gave a lot of people the idea in Syria, in Libya, even in Egypt, hey, and elsewhere too, they were, hey, if Saddam Hussein was not as invulnerable as he seemed, maybe our local dictatorial strongman government, maybe it also isn't uh, involved, maybe, you know. Okay, that was a huge influence on the region. And let's be honest, anyone would step forward and say, oh yeah, but in Iraq, that was only possible because of the involvement of the American military and the CIA. There were a lot of people in Syria who expected that if they started the ball rolling, there would be an active intervention from the U.S. military and the CIA. And there was. I mean, on a small scale, but there was. You'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to think Barack Obama did nothing in Syria during those years. He did. He did a lot, but not as much as the outright full-scale invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan. Still, um, there was a little-known politician named Hillary Clinton, who was the number one hawk, saying that they should take advantage of the temporary disorder in Libya to really maximize CIA, black ops, and maybe outright military intervention in Libya. So it's not the case that these people were so naive that they looked at the Arab Spring and thought this was a symbol of nonviolent activism. No, that was idiots. <laughs> I can't even say, I think Gene Sharp was completely cynical, but idiots who took this story about Gene Sharp and his book and ran with it, those people were trying to manufacture and misrepresent this as an example of nonviolent regime change. I think the the people within the Arab, Arabic speaking world, they looked at the reality of this and said, okay, with or without US military support, we can get this started. And then very likely, as soon as cracks start to show in the regime, we will get some US military support, we'll get some CIA support, and we can keep the ball rolling and have a regime change that is convenient for the United States of America. It's probably convenient for Israel probably convenient for a whole bunch of strange bedfellows across the region. You know, in some cases, Saudi Arabia, in some cases, Iran. Other people may want to get involved with uh, watching the cookie crumble. So it's it's not the case that people within the Arab world were so jejun as the people outside in the predominantly white English-speaking world who wanted to manufacture this myth of it. All right? So the final saddening conclusion we have to stress here, Gene Sharp is now dead. If you Google his name, you will get the obituaries, all of which, I mean, I understand when someone's just died, nobody wants to say anything uh, overly harsh or critical. The obituaries written about the man soon after his death all just say that he had this wonderful positive effect on the Arab Spring, this wonderful positive effect on Syria and Libya. There's no statement that these things were disasters for the people involved or that there's really no evidence at all that they were following a playbook provided by Gene Sharp. This is a myth, but the, the most fundamental myth being misrepresenting the Arab Spring as if it was a success rather than a failure, and as if it were nonviolent instead of violent. Very strange. But I noticed in his obituaries, people had more or less given up the attempt at glorifying the old we are the 99% uh, movement, the Occupy Wall Street movement. And back in 2011, 2012, that was his other claim to fame, was that he was somehow, he and his books were somehow the crucial catalyst in this, this other movement that was, again, from my perspective, an absolute failure, an absolute disaster. So I end the video by asking the question, are there any new ideas in politics in the 21st century? Extinction Rebellion rose to the top of the charts. They got on the front page of all the newspapers. They briefly disrupted life in London, England, and they were passionately promising to you they had a fundamentally new way to do politics. And if you look at the methods of what they actually did and what they attempted and so on, it's no more new and no more exciting and no more innovative than the list of 198 methods in Gene Sharp's garbage book. Again, within veganism, within ecology, I've criticized all of these things. We, we have, uh, I don't know, one sort of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed foundation after another that pops up and says, we're not going to be like the charities in the past. Give us your money. We're going to do something new and innovative and profoundly different uh, like never before, and therefore we're going to get results like never before. And very often, I mean, if we could just use Socratic dialogue with these people, 
if any of these people would come on Skype and speak to me, I would ask, and I would ask in a genuinely open-minded way, what are these new ideas? What are these new methods? On what basis should donors giving money to your foundation feel confident that you are going to accomplish something with it? Fundamentally different from fundamentally better than the foundations that came before, the street protest movements that came before. All I see is the cynical recycling of the myth of civil disobedience to get your money out of your wallet and into their bank account. Da -da 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 -da.